This is the day that the Lord has made. Flesh, human tendencies, we all have our moments. But faith says, let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are here today to celebrate a life, an amazing life, the life of our dear husband, father, grandfather, brother, and friend, Brother Jerry Hardwick. Yes, tears will be shed because we're going to miss him. But our faith tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ made true to his promise that we know that Brother Jerry is in the hands of our Lord and our God. So yes, we cry, but we don't have to cry like people who have no hope. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If Brother Jerry meant anything to anybody in this place, put those hands together and let's celebrate a life well lived. You may be seated in the presence of our almighty God. We are going to follow the order of service as prayer as we continue to pray and support, acknowledge and respect this amazing family as we follow this program accordingly. We're going to have song by Eastern Star Church, followed by scripture, Old Testament by Clarence Crane, New Testament, Andre, O and prayer by Neil Esterbrook. And I'll be back in that order.
and was able to see you and the way you were always working on him, always bringing him closer to you, always blessing him. Father, I want to acknowledge this great quality of Jerry's today in front of all who have gathered because he passed this blessing on to us, giving us the gift to also look for you in our everyday lives, in our struggles, and in our victories. Father, we grieve his loss, but we know he is with you. So we pray that you send your spirit to be with us today. Come, Holy Spirit, come and comfort us as we gather to remember the life of Jerry. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for the word of God and for those amazing, amazing prayers as we spoke to our Lord and our Savior. We are going to now have another song by the Star Church, followed by the uh, acknowledgments and presentations by Pat Payne, and I'll be back to bring forth those who will share remarks.
but we will do our best to at least recognize the sender. Uh, before I begin, I would like to invite Mr. Andre Gibbons of 100 Black Men to come up. Um, and as he comes up, the memories flow back of the 100 Black Men African American Challenge. Um, oh my. Um, he was our greatest, our greatest router. He was there when we won two nationals. So please come. And acknowledge this great, great man. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today, um, once again, Andre Gibbons, and I have the distinct honor to serve as the president of this fine organization. And at this time, I'll share the resolution that the organization prepared for our brother Jerry Perkins. First, will all of the members please stand? Cast members, if you can. <laughs> On this day, September 3rd, 2021, the 100, 100 Black Men of Indianapolis, Inc. does hereby resolve that our brother, Mr. Jerry Hartness, member and role model for the youth in Indianapolis and beyond, exemplified the 100th model of what they see is what they'll be. That with an unwavering commitment and belief in service was a faithful member of the 100 black men of Indianapolis Inc. Their brother Hartness gave generally, generously of his resources, talents, and time as the executive director, member, mentor, advocate, friend, and other volunteer roles within the organization. That is this acknowledgement of his great work. Brother Jerry Hartness is hereby recognized as 100 black men of Indianapolis, the nearest member. On behalf of the 100, we express our deepest sympathy to the family of Mr. Jerry Hartness. We acknowledge his dedication to the 100 and personal commitment to the youth enrichment for more than 30 years. Psalms 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds us up their wounds. God bless. It is that belief 
that sustains our faith through the most difficult times. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Humbly submitted, Pastor Jeffrey A. Johnson, Sr., Senior Pastor of the Eastern Star Church. Sister Sarah Scruggs Harkness and the entire family of Brother Jerry Harkness. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Dear Sister Sarah and family, Pastor Jeffrey A. Johnson, Sr. and the Eastern Star Church, Senior Saints Ministry and Church family, extend our condolences and heartfelt sympathy to you and your family in the home going of your beloved husband, Jerry. As believers, we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. However, the departure of a loved one, whether the passing came suddenly or after a lingering illness is difficult. Please know that Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider is your comforter during pain your light in darkness, and your hope in the loss. The Eastern Star Church family encourages you, your family, and friends to continue to trust and rejoice in the Lord's promise that he will never leave or forsake us. May you feel his powerful presence and peace as you grieve today and in your tomorrow. May you always be enfolded in his love as you celebrate the memory of Brother Jerry Harkness. Blessings always, the Eastern Star Church Senior Saints Ministry. Minister William G. Bullock, third president. Minister James H. Woodard, ministry administrator. To the family of Jerry Harkness. We reach out to the family in sympathy and love and commend you to a loving Savior who is the author and finisher of our faith. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts. Seek his will in all you do, and he will direct your paths. God gives us healing for our pain and comfort for our grief. His consolation is our hope, the strength, our belief. Although life's earthly end is never pleasant, but God's promises of eternal life in the presences of our risen Savior Jesus Christ gives joy. Our prayer is that God will comfort you and give you strength in knowing that earth hath no sorrow that heaven cannot Lovingly and humbly submitted, Bishop Kevin M. Harrison, Jr., First Lady Deborah Harrison, and the Grace Apostolic Church family. We also have acknowledgments from uh, Congressman Andre Carson, Senator Jeannie Burrow, State Senator Jeannie Burrell, Vanessa Summers, State Representative, House 99, Cherish S. Pryor, State Representative, Democratic Floor Leader, House District 94, and from the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus. State Representative Robin Schaffer, IBLC Chair. And I will end by with these words from Matthew 25, 21. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will let you be.
be overmuch. Enter into the joy of your master. Black Angel, Jerry Harkness, now on duty. This time, now we're going to have special remarks as those that are on the program come and to share their heart and to make it clear as much as he has meant to all of us, you'll get a chance to hear just a glimpse from the few who are on program this year, I'm sure that if we all had the opportunity, we all have a story that we could all tell about how we have been touched and impacted by Jerry and this amazing family. But in respect to the family, we're going to follow the program as printed. If you will come, those who are on program to give remarks, Brother Darrell Daniel uh, will be giving remarks on behalf of East Sioux Star Church, Elbert, Dean, if you would come, 70 year childhood friend. Um, Steve Watson from Loyola University of Chicago, if you guys would come in that order. Good morning. Good morning. And all praises to our God. I want to suggest to you that if you look in the dictionary and look up the word love, you will see a picture of Jerry and Sarah. I was blessed to be a privilege to witness that love some 20 odd years ago. Sarah reminded me I first visited Jerry some 20 years ago in the hospital. And I was blessed to be a part of his journey as he partnered home over the last few weeks. And I saw pictures of that love. And my estimation of Brother Jerry Harvest never changed. I knew him as a quiet, very humble man. And one of the last words I remember him speaking to me when we were there was, I appreciate you. And he had no idea, or I'm sure he has no idea, the impact that he has on all the lives that he has touched. So thank you for allowing me to share in that journey. To, your son, to his son and daughter, I want to leave this with you. The Hebrew people of the First Testament taught us something about names. When Moses asked God, God, what is your name? When I go before Pharaoh, God, he's going to want to know your name. And you have to understand the context of his question. When the Hebrew people gave names, it was indicative of history, destiny, and future. So in essence, Moses was asking God, give me a name that encompasses the totality of your being. And God in essence was saying, and most of you don't know what you're asking, the Hebrew language is not large enough, the English language, the Latin is not long enough. So just let me leave you with this name. I am that I am. I am fill in the blank because God will be what you need when you need. Sister Sarah, when the tears start falling, son and daughter, when the tears start to falling, May the God of I am embrace you in mighty and new and surprising ways. God bless you. Peace be unto everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I've had the privilege and opportunity to uh, have. Uh, possibly uh, the longest time to spend with Gerald probably amongst you here. Uh, I spent about 70 years with him uh, in the community that we come out of. I, I just want to say that to, uh, uh, I know all of you have had the privilege and opportunity to have special relationships with him. All of you here have something specifically that you can say that you've done with him. And we thank and appreciate 
the respect that you're giving him here in Indianapolis. Uh, he was a great, great man. From the time I met him, that's 70 years ago, uh, at that period of time, uh, we made it, shaked him up to send him to you. So, so you could do something with him. Uh, yeah, he was a teenager, and uh, we um, uh, met him on the basketball court, of course. But um, he was more than a basketball player, which I would like to try to allude to for a few minutes. But uh, just to show you uh, the dynamics of uh, how he came about, uh, being the kind of person he is, was, is, um, and that was that uh, we came out of a housing project uh, called Patterson Project in New York City, in the Bronx, New York. Now actually he was in Harlem first. He came out of Harlem uh, to the Bronx um, with all some skills already uh, in basketball. Uh, what he did there in Harlem, he had a tournament that they used to play in, and people that he was around, a coach that they had, they called Hall Rucker, who was a well-trained uh, college player who trained all of the young people in Harlem how to play basketball. He tied it with them, and he kind of gave them his basics over there in Harlem. But what happened was, when they finished with him in Harlem, they sent him to the Bronx. Uh, when he got to the Bronx and the projects there, we had, uh, we had formed a team uh, called the Clowns uh, at that time. And uh, what we did was we had to counter some very rough people. If I don't know about you, if you know about the housing projects, but the housing projects have about 20 buildings, 13 story high. And each one of those buildings, there were apartments, uh, four to two to four families on each floor. And in each of those floors, with all of those families, with all of those people, there were a bunch of teenagers. All of those teenagers that was on those and those floors came out every day to be competitive, to be the best that they could be and whatever athletic activities there were to be participating in. Of course, we were all uh, vibing to be some of everything. We were running track, uh, we were playing softball, uh, we ran the, uh, running board jump, and, you know, all those kinds of things. And then we, of course, got to the main issue, basketball. And everybody and their mother wanted to play basketball. And not only that, we had the guys who were supposed to be playing football wanted to play basketball. So with that, you had to come out to be competitive to the degree where you had to take a lot of beatings. And Gerald was one of those guys that survived the beatings, and I was fortunate enough to be with him to help him along a little bit so he didn't get beat up as much. But uh, anyway, uh, that was kind of like how we had introduced the Gerald but When he came from Harlem, uh, we had the team already formed and we were playing out there one day and so, you know, this kid comes up and uh, he said, well, can I play with you guys? So we said, yeah, hey, we give this guy a chance because we know we're gonna send the butchers out after him, see how he turns out after the butchers finish. So he got out there and he started playing and he was very good, you know, so this guy's pretty good out there. And he's holding his own. And so about a two weeks later, after he was going through that for a while, we came up with the understanding that, hey, well, we gotta put this guy on our team. So we wound up putting him on the team. And uh, nevertheless, you know, in the community there, at the time, we were playing basketball to several of the community groups we had. The Italians over in one area, we had the Irish in one area. We had a, a community, communities of African-Americans and other projects, 
We had people that was multi-talented in our community, and our community was uh, uh, at first, you know, we had a very versatile community. We had Latin people there, we had Caucasians there, we had African Americans there. We were all diverse there. So we put him on the team, and we would win some games when he did before he came. But what after he came, it became no. Don't be with those guys, because you're going to lose. He was came a winner from day one. He was always a champion. He was always an inspirational guy. And he would not let you lose. Like Ron Miller told me when he got into Loyola, he told me, he said, listen, one thing about Jerry, he won't let you lose. That was the kind of person he was, the character that he had. And he's always lived up to that all through his life. I was fortunate. Uh, to have spent the time with him, uh, going through those years with him. Uh, he dragged me along, you know. Uh, he came and he got me several times. After he went to college to Loyola, uh, we went to uh, Madison Square Garden. We shared uh, the time of uh, Oscar Robinson, scoring 50 points in Madison Square Garden. Uh, we shared that time together, as well as many other times. Uh, and not only that, uh, he was not only just a basketball player. Uh, he says a few other things that he really enjoyed. Uh, he was a wonderful dancer. He's a lovely dancer. He love to dance. Uh, you know, this is the part that you guys maybe don't got a chance to see. In fact, he was a Latin dancer. You know, he loved the mambo. He loved the cha-cha-cha. And boy, did he love the merengue. The merengue was his thing. Uh, and uh, not only that, uh, you know, he was a ping pong player. He played ping pong. And uh, as well, he was a distant runner, you know. He was a, a, a distant runner, which you call a uh, long distant runner, miles. He liked to run miles and stuff. And uh, one of the things that caused us to uh, opportunity to beat a lot of teams because we were all track people and we would outrun these guys and they'd get tired. So they didn't have a chance when it got down to like the fourth quarter. We would still be running, you know. So anyway, Gerald was that type of person. Uh, he led us to a lot of victories. We were very, we wasn't losing any games. And then we moved on. He left us and when he got to high school, he went to Dewitt Clinton High School. I said, I know I'm spending my time here, don't worry. <laughs> well, I had the most time with him, so I missed that more time than I should. Madison Square Garden to play the championship against them. 
and uh, they beat him. Gerald beat them and became the most valuable player. Another victory in his step. So, Gerald was the kind of person that's been a winner and has been winning all his life and many, many things. And I, I just, well, I think I gotta stop because <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta go. I gotta stop. <laughs> but I, I just want to acknowledge, acknowledge two more things before I get up. <laughs> and, and that is number one, um, yesterday I had the privilege of uh, witnessing the Indianapolis community here and uh, your love for him. That really.
That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, my name is Steve Watson, and I serve in the athletic department at Loyola University of Chicago, the school that Jerry led to the national championship back in 1963. <laughs> his, his backcourt mate on that team was Jack Egan. Jack was the, the little white point guard from the south side of Chicago. <laughs> who would become one of Jerry's closest friends. Jack was supposed to represent the Loyola Ramblers today, but his wife has some health issues, and that's kept him from coming. And I can tell you that it's been extremely difficult for him. He wanted nothing more than to be here to honor his teammate and his friend. So I, I spoke to Jack to see if he had any advice or stories for me. And literally 45 minutes later, I had three pages of notes and about 15 stories, way too many for me to share. But the, the thing about the stories that Jack shared with me and the stories I've heard from his other teammates over the years is that there was a consistent theme. Jerry was selfless, humble, thoughtful, and he never wanted it to be about him. Now, J Jerry did enjoy some benefits of being the best player on the team. When Coach Ireland would pass out meal money to the guys, Jerry would oftentimes get a little bit extra. And that's just the way it was. One day, one of the younger bench players complained about the preferential treatment that Jerry was getting. And one of the veteran guys told him, just be thankful that Coach doesn't pass out all the money based on how good we are. Because if he did, Jerry would get a lot more than he's already getting. Money. And you probably wouldn't get anything at all. The Loyola basketball banquet was a big deal back when Jerry played. At that banquet, Jerry was named the, Le the Loyola's most valuable player after his sophomore year, and then again after his junior year. Before the banquet, after Jerry's senior year, the year he led them to the national championship, unbeknownst to any of Jerry's teammates, Jerry went to Coach Ireland and insisted that all five starters on that team were named most valuable players. And that's what Coach Ireland did. All five of those guys got MVP trophies, even though everyone knew who the real MVP was. And when I was told that story, I just kind of nodded and, and, and said, yep, that's Jerry. Selfless, thoughtful, never wanted it to be about him. Jerry was always so proud of all that he and his loyal teammates were able to accomplish during and after their time on campus. He was equally proud of the recent Loyola teams who he has stayed close to over the years. Jerry bled maroon and gold, and we're fortunate to call him a Rambler. We're all so lucky to have Jerry in our lives. He was a great man, someone we could all look up to and aspire to be like. We'll miss you, Jerry, but you'll always be with us. Thank you. Amen. And now we're going to have Rosemary Gold, who is the wife of Joe Dan Gold, the famous handshake. Uh, Darnell Hillman, the Indiana Pacers friend. And Julie will come in that order. I can't express how honored <clears throat> I was when Sarah called and asked me to speak today. I have several of my family members here, my daughter and her husband, and my husband, my late husband's brother, Bill, and his wife, Sheila. And I'm always surrounded by my family and I love that about them. The message I want to send today has to do with the relationship that came about because of the game of change. I had notes, but I'm going to talk from my heart. I, I, I won't take very long. But this all started in Detroit on March 15, 1963, when Mississippi State and Loyola University were paired together in the regional finals, or the regional tournament. 
They um, were excited, both Jodan and Jerry. They were there just to play the game. Strangely enough, when they both walked out to center court to shake hands, light bulbs flashed all over the place. And I think at that moment I have heard both of them, I heard both of them say, it's more than just a game. They just realized that then. We were all very touched by the conversations we've had through the years about that game of change. Gerald is the one who is responsible for the relationship that Jodan, my late husband, and Jerry developed. And it was a wonderful relationship. Their philosophies about life, their love of young people, their mentorships, it all blended beautifully together. Neither one of them ever bragged. They both had very successful careers. Um, they were humble, both of them. And I think that's why they got along so well. They had gentle conversations and meant so much to each other. But Gerald, I thank you for that because he interviewed the two of them in 2007 in Indianapolis at that home that's a museum. <laughs> and, um, that day was their second handshake. That first handshake in 1963, and those two men had not seen each other until 2007, when Gerald brought them to Indian, or brought my husband to Indianapolis and interviewed them for his project and that wonderful documentary, The Game of Change. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit a lot between 2007 and 2011 occurred. Uh, we had reunions. We were in Detroit, we were in Chicago. We had wonderful, wonderful times getting together. Started making phone calls back and forth. Um, we bonded, the Harkness family and the Gobi family. Um, our hearts were with each other at all times. In 2011, my husband passed away. He had two funerals, one in Eastern Kentucky and the visitation the next evening was in Western Kentucky. It was a really busy time, just like I know you've had this past few weeks, Sarah. But we're standing by the casket. The family, the Gold family, had no idea, but looked up at the middle aisle. And we all had tears in our eyes. Guess who was there? Jerry. And I cannot tell you how precious that was to all of us. They cared so much about each other. And Sarah and I got in that circle too. And we have become very dear friends. I'll say sisters is what I'll say. Um, after the funeral and after um, I began adjusting to a different life. Um, it appeared that everything we did was almost a reflection on something 
I've learned from Jodan. And I'm sure it's that's going to be that same way with you, Sarah. You're, you're going to reflect, and those beautiful memories are what's going to keep you going and carrying on his legacy. I would like to say that I feel like I, my family, I would say feel the same way, that we are a part of the Harkness family. And I want you to know that you all are part of ours. For you, Julie, for you, Julie, Sarah, and Gerald, I'd like to share this. For I know the plans I have for you, said the Lord. They are for good, not evil. To give you a future and hope. A lasting impression of Jerry Harkness remains in all of our hearts. Let us all carry on. Both Jerry and my late husband, Joe Dan's legacies. God bless you all, and thank you for allowing me to share a little bit about my love of Jerry Harkness. Sarah, I love you. for this man. I've heard many expressions. I've heard a lot of things said about him. But the one thing that Jerry was for me, aside from being just my mentor, when I first came here to Indianapolis, I was fortunate enough to move into the same neighborhood that Jerry lived in. Difficult neighborhood, but the ambassador what the title that I've given Jerry. He was a great ambassador to the city, to the state, to all of these young, inner city, young black men that he chose to help. He has remained and will always be a very important part of my life and accomplishment. When I came here to Indianapolis, very shy and quiet and bashful. I watched Jerry in the neighborhood and his ability to quiet down an argument, get people to work together, was by far second to none. I admired that in him. I chose to be and walk like Jerry simply because of the things that he has done not just on the basketball court, but the things that he accomplished on the basketball court didn't just stop with basketball. He continued on. And it's not about our destination, but it's about the journey. And the journey that Jerry has taken, I think he can be a great model for many of us. Very humble, very quiet, didn't boast. The one thing that I really liked about him never quit. You may tell him no, you may stop him, but you could never stop him from succeeding. He was always going to find that way to get there. And Jerry has um, records that will never be broken. And one of the records that he has that um, I remember it when I first came here, he's got the longest shot made for the Indian. That shot will never be touched, I don't believe, ever. That will keep me locked in with him. The Indiana Pacers have always been family. And any of you know, know the players, you know how close and tight we are. And 
one of the most important things that uh, during my job that was facing me, Jerry was always very encouraging to me. Difficult job to be in, but every time I spoke with him, every time I talked with him, just had nothing but encouraging words to say to me, to keep me involved, to keep me at my task. And I followed, simply following his words. I followed him in that journey, and I'm very grateful for that and very thankful to him for having given that to me and to have followed in his footpath. The Lord has taken a great man. We will miss him. together as Julie comes. Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Julie Harkness Arnold. Jerry Harkness is my father. Okay, let's see. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to thank everyone for traveling near and far to celebrate my father. Yesterday I met somebody who came from Alaska. That blew my mind. We have been touched and moved by all of these special stories that everyone has shared, and I thank you. And I believe we can all agree that my father was a sweet man of greatness. He was exceptional in sports, a true champion, and he was phenomenal within our community. He had the gift of giving one-on-one -on -one personal advice and then showing up at large for our society. It is a blessing so many have been touched and got a taste of what it was like to know him within our community. I would like to share with you a few things of what it was like to know him as his daughter. My father was the my father was the type of father who would write me letters. He would leave these letters on my bedside table so I would see them when I woke up. He wrote me letters when I was away at college. He wrote me a poem on my wedding day. My dad was the type of dad who took me on dates. When he worked at Channel 13, he and my mom found one night, it was very, very late after work, to take me out to dinner. They knew it was way after my bedtime, but my father wanted this special time with me. So at age four, I still remember this night, me being sleepy, but beaming with excited joy, watching my father do the sport news live, and then us going out to dinner after 11 p.m. So sleepy, but so excited. And I felt the same way too. Several dates, several date nights were to follow. Square dances during Girl Scouts, Tickets to watch Alvin Ailey dance either. Even gala events throughout Indianapolis fundraisers. We enjoyed every night, every date night, fond moments that I loved. My dad was the type of dad who would leave gifts for me. Around my sweet 16th birthday, my dad was off broadcasting doing the sports for the Indianapolis Pacers in another city. But I remember waking up and finding this beautiful ring inside his case on my bedside. I'm blessed to re wear this ring today. When I think of my dad, the words that pop in my mind are kind, loving, positive, and patient. He was also very humble. We really had fun with each other. We had long talks, and then we didn't talk at all. We just enjoyed each other's space, all while smiling, just smiling. This is a gift. To be in someone's space, not talking, but just smiling and being silent with one another. I cherish that with my father. We loved watching the Olympics together. Yes, he was ever the sportsman. He coached both Gerald and I into our championships. He answered questions that I didn't understand. 
that I have a question about, like, why Shaq didn't make his free throws? Like, that was his job. Like, why was he making his free throws? When I stopped playing sports and began training as a dancer, my father told me it just broke his heart. But before I knew it, I was literally in the dance studio, and I glanced outside the window of the dance studio, and there was my father watching me practice. And my last days with him, we still were watching fervently and yelling at the screen at the most random events during the Olympics, cycling, swimming, and his favorite track and field. We were at the hospital, and I was nervous that we were disturbing the other patients because me and my dad, we were all in it, all, all into the 2020 Olympics. But we got to enjoy it one last time together. That was just a month ago. My dad is the type of dance dad to teach me about friendship. I have some great best friends, Ashanti, Dawn, Tiffany, Darby, and Jen Clip, all of whom I have known since age 14 or before. My dad still has his very best friend since the age of 13, Albert Shepsi Dean, who spoke earlier, and who's still thriving and going strong. I love my dad, and I'm going to miss him greatly. He was really a fantastic grandfather. On a few occasions, my dad and Sarah would be gone with my girls for so long, I would begin to worry. I couldn't understand what they were doing that meant that they would spend the whole day away. But my dad, grandpa, would be at the zoo or at the mall. He would ride the escalator with then my toddler daughter, Anna Grace, over a hundred times. Or he would be at Universal Studios riding roller coasters at the age of 78. My daughters and my nieces only have great and beautiful, active memories of my dad. And so today, they wear Chuck Taylors in remembrance of their champion grandfather and all their fun activities, and in remembrance of his days on the court as a pacer, as a Nick, as a rambler. And my dad was a champion. Champion runs through my veins as it does my daughters now and my nieces. He was an exceptional man. Both my daughters are very busy in our community with doing volunteer work. Last year, Anna Grace was recognized at our school for her ex excellence in community service, even during COVID. We all know where I'm going with this. United Way, Kairos, 100 Black Men. His, my father's fervor for giving back, reaching back, and serving others, it lives on. Dad, it lives on. At the end, at the end, my father with me just a month ago seemed to be almost full of health. I felt I had been given the gift of borrowed time, time to see him walk, time to see him laugh, and of course, to watch the Olympics. But one of my most special gifts he left me is one that is the least expected. It is that of love. Yes, the love my dad had for me is evident, but I got to see and witness and learn a different kind of love, one that is unconditional, and even in pain, is very alive and strong. I got to witness my dad's wife, Sarah, in action. My father couldn't be great all alone. Sarah was there, kind, patient, loving, positive, and strong. At his very end, she didn't leave his side, even going days without sleep and food. I got to see real love. The mystical kind of God kind of love in action. And I'm thankful for this. At my dad's last moments, as he was transitioning during the middle of the night, Sarah FaceTimed me to have that this most sacred moment with her. And we prayed to my dad, dad to heaven. Experiencing, watching, seeing this love, I have learned to love my husband in a deeper, different kind of way. As my husband has learned from my dad a way to love his daughters, as my dad loved me. This is a gift. This type of unconditional love, an action of greatness, something dear and exceptional, as my dad was, that is carried on in his wife and in me. To that, Sarah, I say bravo. And to the, world, to the words, I consistently and constantly find myself saying 
over and over and over again to my father, ever so trite, ever so simple. I wish to say to you as well, Sarah, thank you. My last words to my dad after I prayed with him was simply, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is from my brother Gerald. He wrote, my adoring father, my unwavering friend, my absolute inspiration. We were great at enjoying life together. I'm so proud of all the lives you have touched. How lucky am I to be your son? And I say, how lucky, how blessed am I to be your daughter? Thank you. God is good. Let's give them another hand. Let's do that. And after the Easter Star Church shares another selection, then I'll be back to share the words from the word of the Lord, what the Lord placed on my heart for you, the family, at this time.
is thy name in all the earth. I thank you, Father, for a life well lived and a legacy that we'll forever cherish. Now, Father, in this moment, let us hear from your word. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts allow them now to be holy and acceptable unto thee, O God. For Lord, you are a rock, you are a strength, you are a redeemer. Have your way, Holy Spirit. We want to hear from you. And it is in Jesus' name that we do pray. Somebody shout amen. Amen, amen, amen. Again, I want to thank Bishop Harrison and the leaders and all, for all of your hospitality to all the men women of God who share the sacred space with me and to our family and friends, this beloved family. You know, when, when you look at someone like Brother Jerry and the life that he lived, you don't have to get up and say much because his life spoke for itself. And for the record, Brother Elbert, I could have sat here all day <laughs> listening to the stories over and over again. I didn't just, I, didn't, I, I just didn't want to get kicked out. Amen. I want to keep it. <laughs> I love you guys. So Sarah, what a light you guys have even been in my life. I do. When I first came to the city, of Indianapolis, 20-some-year-old, single uh, man, uh, young boy, uh, coming into this enormous ministry, overwhelmed, wondering how it's going to fit. You guys were one of the first couples I saw. And when you guys came, you came with such grace, so encouraging, in moments that I was even doubting myself, but the encouragement that you guys gave to me, the smile Brother Jerry gave, and, and, and I'll be honest, uh, when I first came to the city, I was, I was ignorant. I didn't know. I just, I didn't know. I'm sitting there thinking, this is such, what a beautiful couple. And then when I got engaged and got married, and I was like, yeah, and I, you should tell Tara, babe, now that's us right there. We're going for that. Look at it. Look how they sit beside each other. Look how they're always around each other, smiling. They're not, no, that's not a tolerating spirit there. That's a, they actually like each other. You know, they, we, you know, we were having those conversations. And I was ignorant. I didn't know until I took on the role um, for chaplaincy and sat in, in one of the games. And when I was set at one of the games, and they, I saw, I saw you guys again. And when I saw you guys again, they made this big announcement in, in acknowledging and recognizing Brother Jerry. And I was like, he's a legend? <laughs> I had no, of course then, do the research, do the, and I'm thinking, oh my God, for, for a man that accomplished so much and then I thought about it. You know, when you do that much and make that much of an impact, let your work speak for itself. That's exactly what Brother Jerry did. There's a word. I, I literally just want to lift these few verses up. It's not, I just want to lift this up and share this with someone real quick because literally this is what reminded me of of this, this amazing life that we are celebrating today. It's the life of John the Baptist. John the Baptist literally was the one that Jesus said this. Jesus said, out of all the men born of a woman, there is not one greater than John. He shared that. And this is a man that made very clear he walked in humility. And 
something happened when he passed. I want to talk about it. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 12, it literally says these words. This is after John the Baptist, great man, when he passed. It says, and the disciples came together and took the body and buried it. Then they went and talked to Jesus. Literally says, and the disciples came together and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. Just for a moment, I want to talk about when a great man has passed. When a great man has passed. Jesus makes it very clear. Of the greatness of John. Makes it very clear. Points him out. So that it is very clear. That Jesus is not mistaken in him for no one. Other than who he is. John carried himself. With a level of humility. Because with all the work that John the Baptist accomplished. He still pointed people to Jesus. And at this point, after living his life and his life coming on the earth to a close, some things happen. Because it is at this moment that we understand that when a good man passes, you don't respond like just anybody. When a good man passes, there's a certain way that you conduct yourself. I'm sure you've lived long enough to know that based upon how people responded, talked about how some other people may have passed before. You have to deal with challenges and struggles and strife and all of that. Not when it's a good man. And definitely not when it's a great man. Text says something. I'm going to lift this up. We'll go. Because now that he has passed, Matthew says in his word, watch this, says this in, in verse 12. And so the disciples came together. Here are people from different backgrounds, people from different areas, people from different levels of history, race, people who are coming together for this one man. Because when a good man passes, this is never the time for people to separate. This is the time where the people come together. Their strength that we gather when we come together. There's a level of relief and encouragement that we receive when we come together. It's the whole picture of a team. Because when a team comes together, they come together with one goal in mind, and that goal is to get the victory. Now, look at teams, and especially on the court, something I, I notice, even in basketball, that even with the team, with them coming together, with them working together, with them gathering together, it does not mean that somebody is not going to fight. <laughs> there are going to be somebody on the team that's going to do something, that's going to make some kind of move, but the good thing is, notice this about basketball, that no matter how many times they foul, I've never seen a teammate spend time on the court 
chastise him. They might slap him on the behind, but not chastise him, not, not bringing one down. Because at the end of the day, we're a team. Another thing I noticed on the court, that every once in a while, somebody is going to fall. Somebody's going to hit the ground. Somebody is going to hit the court. Rather, they've gotten fouled. Rather, they just went, fell awkwardly. Whatever it is, somebody is going to fall. But something I also notice that when a player falls, you ever notice that when they fall, and we're talking sweaty people <laughs> on a court, but when they fall, they just get right back up and keep moving. What about your sweat? Well, there are people around the court that their job, as soon as someone falls, they run on the court and start wiping all of the sweat from their fall. And people can go right back on the court and walk right on it as if the fall never took place. This is what I notice about great men. Great men don't make perfect men. <laughs> Doesn't mean you're perfect, but that you have somebody on your team that can wipe the floor when you have fallen. Am I talking to any people here today? that can acknowledge you have fallen before. But the good news is you look good now. You don't look like what you've been through. Thank God for Jesus who have wiped our mess and made us look like it never happened. It's interesting. They gathered. They came together. Whatever differences they had for this great man, Oh, we're coming together for this. Because we recognize that when we come together, great things can take place. I heard this, this pastor say something once that, uh, that, that just really encouraged me and intrigued me. And it was a story where he was watching the uh, animal ch channel. And while he was watching the animal channel, he saw this particular episode where there were uh, this episode talking about the differences between stallions and uh, donkeys. They didn't quite use donkeys. They used the jack word. <laughs> Got kids here, so I won't use it. But they said there was a difference. Now, they're, they're all bred. They're all big. But there's something different about stallions and donkeys. And what they showed was what made them so different was whenever an enemy would come up to try and take them, this is what you can tell was the difference. Well, stallions would come together. As soon as they see enemies coming, they would come together, put their hands together, and start kicking their hind feet. So whenever some uh, pray, try to come, uh, pray on them, uh, they get a hoof in the jaw or in the mouth or in the face. And they kept, kept on kicking until the ones trying to pray on them leaves. Not so much with the donkeys. Because when the donkeys were under attack, they allowed the pressure that they were under to cause them not to put their heads together, but they put their tails together. And in their own fright, instead of kicking the enemy, they start kicking each other. You want to know what a great man has passed? Where you can have people from all different areas coming together, putting our heads together to make sure that no weapon formed against us shall be able to prosper. Now I hope we don't have 
any donkeys of the day. Because I've come to understand that when a great man has passed, stallions rise, and we show ourselves to be strong in this moment. We are here gathering together to come alongside to be a blessing to you. Another thing, I want to say this, that not only do, did they come together, but the Bible says, watch this, they came together and they buried it. Do you notice? Say it again. They came together and they buried it. Do you notice that this text does not say that they buried him? The text says they buried it. Because what we've come to understand is this, that we are not bodies who just so happen to have a soul. We are souls, living souls, that just so happen to live in a body. And so what we saw and see today is the moment where we are going to take, watch this, and not bury Jerry. Because Jerry is more alive now than he's ever been. To be absent is now to be present. That does not mean elimination. That just means a change in location. This is the moment where we are, were blessed by Brother Jerry's outfit. We were blessed by his uniform because the uniform did not make Brother Jerry. Brother Jerry made the uniform. I have on this robe. This robe, the only reason it's moving now is because I'm moving it. And when I'm done with this robe, I'm going to take this robe off and it's going to lay down. I, you can talk to it. You can say whatever you want to say to it. That robe is not moving because I got out of it. You hear me? What Brother Jerry did was just took off this outfit and put on a new outfit. And so on today, we're not burying him. We're burying the outfit he had on. Because all of us here know that changing clothes ain't that bad when you got something better to put on. He's got a new, he's got a new box. He's got a new home. He's going to a new place. The Bible makes it very clear. That's what I, I love. Yes, we a great man, amazing, was amazing athlete, a wonderful husband, loving father, grandfather. But one thing I, that we also have to acknowledge, Jerry was a child of God. Jerry loved Jesus Christ. He was a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that when you have followed and in relationship with the Lord, to be absent from the body is to be present with him. Yes, we're going to take the outfit he had because we're going to miss that outfit. My God, what an outfit it was. What a smile it was. What a joy. But the work that Brother Jerry released in this earth can never die. The energy and love could never die. Text says that they went. They came together. They buried it. And then they went and told Jesus. Because who else is the one that can handle our pain better? Like the Lord Jesus Christ. I've come to understand that in my walk with the Lord, that regardless of what pain, what struggle we go through in life, have a little talk with Jesus. My grandmother said, tell them all about your struggle. 
He'll hear your faintest cry. And he'll answer by and by. In all of our challenges, we can all be able to lean and depend on the Lord God. Because he will give us strength to deal with what we never thought we'd be able to deal with. In fact, I think somebody here can be an encouragement to Sister Sarah and the family. Is there anybody else in here that's gone through some stuff that you didn't know how you were going to get through it? You didn't know how you were going to make it. You had no idea how you were going to handle another day of it. And not only has it been another day, it's been another year. And you're still here. You're still smiling. You still have your joy. Still have your peace. Still have your sanity. Somebody ought to tell God thank you that he has kept you in the midst of it all. And the same God great man has passed. A great life, well lived, and a great legacy we shall follow. Because a great man has passed, we're gathered together. We're going to bury it. But I promise you, the strength that we need, we're going to gather it and get it from the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we do in this moment now? What do we do when it's all over? What do we do after the services are over and people have gone back home? So Sarah, we're going to trust in the Lord. We're going to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. We're going to believe and we're not going to lean on our own understanding. In all our ways, we're going to acknowledge him. And I promise you, his word is true. God will make your paths straight. Can somebody take a moment and let's celebrate a great man who has peace. deserves it. He deserves it. A great man. A great man. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We honor you and we give you the glory. Father, I ask you that you allow your strength to be made perfect in our times of weakness. You, oh God, and you alone can make it happen. Father, we're going to miss the face of this great man. We're going to miss the encouragement. We're going to miss the advice. We're going to miss the ministry. We're going to miss the examples that he continued to show in his life. Father, we're going to honor his legacy and carry on. We're going to continue to gather together and draw strength from each other. And Father, when it's all said and done, we're not going to stop talking to you because we know our conversations with you gives us what we need. Come alongside this family. Give them strength like none other. And we'll continue to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. Thank you, Father, for loving us and thinking enough about us to release in this earth a great man. We'll give you the glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Clap your hands if you love him with this. Hallelujah.